Hi, and welcome to the Artfully Learning audio series. My name is Adam Zucker. I'll be your host. This is the inaugural episode, and I'm very excited to embark on this new format. After nearly 200 blog posts, this audio series will be a supplemental media platform to share ideas, concepts, and insightful analysis related to art and education. Within the series, I'll be having one-on-one conversations with artists whose work is in tandem with educational concerns and themes. To kick things off, I thought it would be timely and on point to discuss a series of artworks that are inspired by schools themselves. For most of us, the memories of being in school are probably sharply etched into our minds. When I think about my experiences as a public school student, I can close my eyes and envision the sights and sounds throughout the school building and how it felt to be there in the moment. And we're talking about a little bit over 20 years ago at this point. For those of us who teach, the transition from being a student to an educator brings a whole new set of sensory qualities, emotions, and cognition to the school environment. My guest Susan Leopold has spent a lot of time in schools as an artist in residence. As an artist seeking inspiration, the school buildings themselves inspired a range of visual symbolism. Leopold intricately transformed the cavernous and gargantuan architecture of schools into intimate works of art, while still retaining the vitality and essence of the school's setting. Her series of small wall-mounted sculptures represent vacant classrooms, hallways, and offices of schools as an aesthetic exploration into abstraction, as well as a conceptual investigation of memory, youth, and the contrasting nature of schools as both sanctuary spaces and danger zones. Leopold's solo show, titled Schools, is on view at the Elizabeth Harris Gallery in New York City through February 19th. Susan is joining me today for a conversation on schools and the state of education. Hi, Susan. Hi, how are you? Good. It's good to have you on. So let's get right into the conversation. First and foremost, your body of work really resonates and reflects where we are today. After a long period of remote learning, there's been a lot of fluctuation within schools in general. So it's very timely to see your work uh, when I came across it in Chelsea on one of my gallery strolls. And it really captivated me and really struck a chord with me because of many reasons, but especially the time period that we're in today with remote learning, disruptions overall in our culture, and how all these things have impacted the ways we teach, learn, and treat each other. So in your work, there is an overall concept of memory and perception. Um, So I wanted to start from the earliest recollections you have regarding school. Yes, I actually remember when I was in nursery school, um, it was this big open room. There was a lot of, you know, craft materials as all nursery schools have. But I specifically remember making our handprints in the sand. There was like this big table of sand and the plaster casts. And that had a huge impression on me. So that's one of my earliest memories um, of working at school and making art. Was art something that was supported throughout your educational experience? Yes, and I remember in middle school, I really liked the um, art teacher. She was very, she was a little bit strict, but I remember it was very sort of um, almost traditional the way she approached it. And then moving into high school, we had an amazing um, art department in high school. Uh, It was um, Mr. Stuckel and Mr. Ritter and Miss Olivier. And I um, had really great connections with them and the other students in the art classes. And th- it was an amazing program. And I think that really set me on my path to uh, being an artist because of the type of support and encouragement that they gave us. That's great. That's Yeah, so it was really in high school where you would say you formulated the um, idea that, that maybe art was something you could pursue further outside of school. Is that right? Yeah, and it was interesting because at first I was, I'm a very practical person, and I first thought, well, maybe I'll be a medical illustrator, or maybe I'll go into advertising and do design work. But sort of by the end of high school, I realized I didn't want to go to all the school you'd have to go to 
to be a medical illustrator because you basically have to study to be a doctor. And also, I didn't, I'm not a graphic designer. And I sort of, by process of elimination, I really realized I'm an artist. And that's, I've always been doing a lot of making things ever since a child. And so I just sort of embraced the idea that I would go to, you know, continue to uh, follow the path as an artist. And was this something, you mentioned your, your specific educators in high school in particular. Was this something they supported? Did you speak with them about your passion and your ideas to go forward and to have these careers within the art field? You know, I can't really remember, um, but I do know they were incredibly supportive. So I don't remember, I mean, I'm sure they had to write recommendations, but I don't remember being directed like, oh, you should go be an artist, as much as there was this amazing support and wonderful um, program in the school that helped me develop it. And then as I you know, started looking into colleges, knew that that was my path. So they supported the direction I had chosen, but I don't think they encouraged me either way or one way or the other. It sounds overall like there was a fantastic program. How was it sort of set up? Did they, they guide you? When did you start as a freshman or how many, how did it, the curriculum progress? You know, what was the course that you took? You know, it's, again, it was um, so long ago, but I do remember they had a very established art department, like a photography department. You could take drawing, you could take painting. They also had theater, um, but I believe it was probably... Um, like, oh, you would take a drawing class, because I know we did these drawings, and then you would take a painting class with Miss Olivier. She was the painting teacher. But I, I don't, I think at that point it was elective, so if you wanted to take art, I don't think you had to be, I think they were freshmen and sophomores, you know, all ages mixed into the art department. And it was also in the Midwest, outside of Chicago, so there was, um, it wasn't like an inner city school. I think there were a lot more resources. And this was like in the 70s. So it was just a different time. And art was really, uh, you know, part of the curriculum. It wasn't, you know, things weren't being cut at that time. And then it was in case of the artists, the teachers were actually artists themselves. Um, you know, the photography teacher was a photographer. You know, the painting teacher did paintings. You know, so they were artists themselves, which was... Uh, nice to see. That's actually, that segues into sort of the next thing I wanted to speak about then, because you've experienced the educational system from both the perspective of a student taking art classes, as you just mentioned, and an educator, and your full-time job is as a professional artist. So I wanted to know what motivated you to get into education? Um, well, years ago, I lived in Dumbo, a neighborhood in Brooklyn, and they had the Dumbo annual Dumbo Arts Festival, where the local artists would have a big art show and open studios. And at that time, I was on like the committee, and I said, let's include the neighborhood, which was on the um, Brooklyn side of the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. And there was a community there, um, lower income students, you know, kids, and so I, I sought out a community center and started an art program there and tied that into the Dumbo Arts Fair, and we painted a mural with these students who signed up for this class, and that that was just an inspiration because I loved, I loved working in a community, and I found a community to work with. And then we continued, a friend of mine, Pamela Crimmins, and Ed Rath, two friends, we continued to um, work with these students. And this is many, many years later, we're still in touch with several of these students who we had been involved with, you know, this is in the early 80s. Um, so that's what started me. And then when I moved to Manhattan, I started working with Henry Street Settlement at the um, public school. So originally it was self-motivated and we started this young artist painting workshop program in Dumbo at the Dr. White Community Center. And then I, uh, you know, moved into working with Henry Street Settlement as an artist in residence. I also taught at Little Red Schoolhouse um, as an art teacher for a couple of years, seventh and eighth graders. I 
Um, and then I started working um, in higher education. So I no longer work in lower education, but all that experience was extremely transformative because I really was able to, you know, get an inside look at the educational system and work with kids to, to see how, you know, art really was important. At that time, they had cut a lot of programs. So places like Henry Street Settlement or Studio for the School was the vehicle to bring art back into the schools. Right. I was going to say, uh, you know, a lot has probably changed, you know, since that period of time, you know, in between when you were a student, where the arts were well-funded and part of the curriculum. Uh, then we're talking about the 80s and 90s and, you know, the experiences in public schools of a lot of cutbacks. Of course, unfortunately, the arts are some of the first things to go. But now, of course, we've learned that we need all of these activities in the schools for the well-rounded student, both mentally and physically. So it sounds like, you know, n during that period, yes, it was a really uh, transformative time. And you mentioned that, you know, you got a good, not only was it, was it great to see the students engaged in their by having access to the arts and art materials, but you also got an insight into the school system itself. So, and, and that is really represented in this body of work that you have on view now of schools, these small architectural models that really have the essence of the school buildings themselves, but it's a lot more than that. And, I would like to know a little bit more about the impetus behind that, the the inspiration behind these renderings of the school, the physical school spaces, maybe about what your process in the making of these works of art entails. Sure. I um, Well, when I would be working in the schools at the time, I had was using a 35 millimeter camera. So often I would go to a place and then I'd be really inspired by the hallways or the textures or the light coming through the windows or um, and so then I return with my camera and capture them because it was like the, the spaces that were filled with students and all the humanity um, when I would photograph them they were empty of the students but they still like the hallway still vibrated that energy and so it was like the light and the space and the angles and the perspectives that sort of where people would be inha you know, inhabiting later. And then now with my phone, I can take pictures very spontaneously. I'm much easier to um, document my environment. So I use the camera as a way of sketching my environment. And then I would save these photograph for years. And for this particular body of work, I, I turned back to some of my older photographs. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wanted to do a school and was inspired by these photos. And then um, it just happened. So I had these ideas in my head. When it was time for the show, I used the photos and current photos because now we were going into the schools to take um, to get our vaccina you know, vaccinations. So it sort of was my older photographs were from like the school days and then these more recent photographs that I used. And they were the same looking schools. They still look the same. They still have the linoleum floors. They still have the tiled walls. So there's a similarity, even though there's a huge time gap between the time I took those photos. Um, and then, so that's, I used photos as my inspiration and then I sort of merged some of the images together. I sketched them out very loosely on paper, but then I use foam core to and masking tape and sketch three dimensional designs, and then I figure out all the angles. And once I lock in the angles, I move forward with the refined. You know, I use something called gator foam, but also the flexibility while I'm designing them. And these foam core masking tape you know, sketches, 3D sketches, I photograph those because then I might like one angle better than another. So I use the photographs as reference. And in this particular show, I ended up blowing up my photos to um, use as part of the artwork. And so that, you know, when, once I um, lock it in, then I move forward with the refined, making everything very finished and refined. 
and they're housed inside very precise wooden boxes made by a cabinet maker, and they hang on the wall. Yeah, it's a really just a great experience looking at them because you have to get up very close. You know, when you first enter, you know you can see right away the details, but everything, of course, is on a, such a small scale. And so you really have to get up close. And that's such, you know, the opposite of what actually is occurring on a daily basis when you are in these schools, these gargantuan buildings, they're overwhelming with their architecture. As you mentioned, they've changed very little throughout the years, you know, from when I went to public school to when I started teaching, you know, it's, it's just this, it's actually the first day of school and the first day of teaching, you know, I got similar feelings, you know, just from the physical structure of the building being in there you get overwhelmed sort of there's you get lost and while the buildings themselves haven't changed much in their appearance it's really the people with inside of the buildings and the operations that go on the learning the community development which is school is really a community and then you also mentioned the vaccination site which is something that these schools have really uh, had to step up and become a place, you know, to get the students vaccinated, to get community members vaccinated, because schools are in these convenient locations for the community. So, yeah, so they've become really this sort of a heartbeat of the community, you know, the whole, actually the whole system, the nervous system, the heartbeat, the skeleton of everything. And so it's interesting when you see, you know, how intimate you really have to look. And, you know, when you're looking at these works, on such a small scale, you, you notice things that you might not actually see when you're actually in the space. We don't really have the opportunity to take the time to really look. So when I'm looking at these sculptures, you know, it brings a lot of memories, obviously. It evokes a lot of memories of just being in the space, the learning that happened, the teaching then, transitioning between being a student and teaching. And yeah, and then the, this weird moment we're in now too where schools had been shut down for over a year for many people remote learning was going on so actually some longing for these to be back in these environments and you know the absence of that environment and the way you you render these buildings without any sort of trace of students teachers or anything else you know these are they're just um, empty classrooms corridors, hallways. Um, I wonder, you know, how you reflect on it, you know, in the time we're in now with with a lot of things going on in schools in general, but the, there's, there's this sort of eeriness too about it, you know, and I think we have to address that, you know, schools can be a site of danger as well as compassion and learning. Yes, um, I mean, I think the emptiness, you know, sort of I, I, in all of my other work before this, I don't put people in anyway, but because there are no people in it and because of the pandemic and the schools being emptied, it has a different feeling. You know, there's a definite, a different association for this body of work with the emptiness. Um, and also the, yeah, like you say, the, the schools are places where families, it might be their only connection to maybe an English speaking community. A lot of people might not speak English as their first language. And um, the school is the place that can, connects to the parents. You know, that might be their one source to a community where their child and parent are connected to a community and um, a liaison in a way. And then with the violence that goes on in the schools, that's a whole other issue. But again, emptying out the schools and what it means in our country, education as well. Um, and the significance of it, or the lack of respect towards teachers. There's a, a lot of levels going on. And teachers do so much for the community and for the students. To, and, and I think it really became apparent during the epidemic when, you know, students would have to be at home, and someone might have two children, but they only have one computer, so how are they going to Zoom? And if the parent has to work to Zoom, you know, I think a lot of logistics and getting Internet stable internet to a, a, a student. So it was all this other technicalities of keeping the students connected. And the absence of that community also impacted the students so much. So, you know, it's been a, two years of an extremely challenging time, and I think we're still 
you know, suffering and still trying to, um, there's still Zoom classes going on in some places too. There's no real easy answer. Have conversations with students and fellow faculty members influenced these sculptures in any way? Well, you know, not in this particular, um, you know, body of work. It was um, more like years ago when I was doing my boxes and I, when I was working in Dumbo and I'd have the students come to my studio and I had this graffiti wall in one of my boxes of, you know, underneath a bridge sort of, it was a, a diorama. And one of the students came in and he said, wow, you could do graffiti. But I actually didn't do graffiti like with a spray can or the way graffiti's done. I imitated graffiti, but it, it was really interesting how the student responded like, oh, there was this connection that I understood graffiti, but I understood the community, I understood the students, um, you know, they, I had, um, you know, developed connections with them, and so it was, uh, that was something that was really interesting, how they saw me as an artist and what I was doing, and then the other thing is sometimes students would say, well, I don't need to put people in them, they always wanted to know, where are the people? That was, but I, I still don't put people in my works, but um, those are the two things. Um, but more currently, people are definitely, everybody who's had homeschooling with Zoom, you know, my friends who have have uh, children, definitely see these empty spaces as being very poignant, and including myself. My daughter was home Zooming, and I had to do the challenges of, unstable internet and then trying to get it fixed and getting Verizon over and, um, you know, and we already had internet and it still wasn't, it, it's still not always stable. So, you know, it, it's, it has been a challenge for everybody. But I, I will say also the Zooming and all that, um, I work at Parsons and Parsons did an incredible job preparing the faculty for our Zoom sessions and I feel even though it was Zoom and I had students from all over the world in one classroom. Someone would be in Iran, someone would be in China, and then someone would be in Brooklyn. And we were all in the same space. So that was really also another, you know, eye-opening experience. You know, somebody was going to classroom at 12 at night and somebody else was at 12 noon. So it was um, sort of the time zone thing became very apparent. That's, that's the interesting thing. When it's done well it actually certainly can because it connects people from all over and develops, you know, that, that in itself, you are getting someone from Brooklyn or someone from Tehran in the same classroom at the same time via these remote means. It can have great benefits because we develop, you know, these cultural understandings, these multicultural understandings. I think, you know, that's the, that's something I think that can be worked on. We obviously need to do, a lot of thinking and soul searching about educational policy in general, but you know, the way that we give access to these remote resources, these when we can't actually be in these physical school spaces. You know, I guess since you've been in these schools for quite a while and you've worked with a really diverse community of people, different ages, different backgrounds, all different types of learners. I, I'd love to know, you know, as an art educator and an artist, what have been some of the social, emotional, and intellectual benefits you've noticed when children have access to art in these schools? Well, I mean, I have to say Henry Street Settlement really um, gave me an amazing opportunity, and I was able to teach this class, I forget what it was called, it was um, Critical Thinking, um, and art, or art and critical thinking, and how, how to use art to, um, to, as a tool, sort of like as a backdoor to teach students things. And I remember I did this cultural project where students would pick images from the New York Public Library. I had these images, and then make artwork based on them, like his, you know, something from Egypt, like um, a pyramid or. Uh, artifacts from um, the Southwest or South America. And so they, I had them make them and then they had to write about them. And they did these beautiful projects and then I presented them to the teachers one day. And one of the teachers said, 
these are great. Who made these? And I just looked at him and I said, you're students. And he, he had such a low expectation and, um, you know, outlook on these kids. He couldn't even imagine that they were capable of what they did in my, um, in these, in these projects. So that was one experience that was eye-opening. And the other experience was um, we were doing like these stained glass windows and I was having them cut, you know, shapes out of black paper and then putting um, color tissue behind them. So they had to use fractions. They had to divide the paper. And the science teacher was in the room and he came up and he said he was so inspired by watching me because his students didn't understand fractions and for the first time he saw they actually did understand fractions because it was using art as a way to break up a page in a symmetrical way it they didn't get hung up on the like the um academics of it so in those ways art was extremely practical and henry street settlement really used artists often to help bridge that gap because we would work with teachers so um we also had to work with teachers because the artists put in, we were artists, not licensed teachers, so we couldn't work alone with the students. So we always worked with a classroom teacher. So it was, you know, I'd come in with my projects and then I would work with the teacher and they would help. But it was, um, so those were two experiences that really, um, you know, uh, were eye-opening. And then the other thing was um, working in the uh, Farragut houses you know, we did this mural, we painted our names, and years later, this uh, his name is Kevin Roundtree, and he's an amazing artist now, and he's 40, and I met him when he was 10. He um, went to our mural, it still existed, he looked at my name and Pamela's name, and this was before, like, the internet, he uh, called us, he found our numbers, and he just wanted to thank us, because we had changed his life by this art program. And he now had children, and um, and we've actually since he called us, we've uh, reconnected. My friend Pamela, and Kevin, and I, and um, and a couple other, several other students from that, um, you know, the early '80s. So it, it does make a difference, you know. It really does it does impact, you know. I guess just getting students to be excited about something. Um, and connecting to maybe a mentor, and maybe art is a mentorship that can really be helpful because it's it's not you know prejudging them if they're smart or not smart. You know there aren't um, you know you can give them a certain personal flexibility and an emotional flexibility that um, allows them to have a little more courage, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. I think that that nailed it right on the head. I mean, the, the, your experiences are exactly like the experiences that I've had both as a student and an educator. And I think it speaks to the greater population of students and educators who have access to the arts, to cultural organizations coming in and doing collaborations in schools. It's definitely essential for learning across the curriculum, as you mentioned. Not all students think the same. You know, everyone's bringing in their own backgrounds, their own identities, and art really is great at flourishing that. The, the emotional side of it, while developing understandings for academic content, like you mentioned, learning fractions. For me, math too. I was challenged at math until I looked at work much later on and understood it actually through art, which is kind of a aha moment I had later. You know, I wish that they had integrated that into the math program. I might not have had to retake the Regents one year if I had, you know, had these exposure to art because it's such a visual and expressive means that really makes you thirsty to, to really get into it and, and to observe and to look. And I think that's important, you know, with everything going on, this, this fast-paced world, just really taking the time to look. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, people, and I think always, including myself, getting caught up in the devices, our brains don't have that time to be. In fact, I was just telling my Parsons students the other day, we need time to be bored because that's when your brain starts to be creative. And if you're always plugged in, you don't have any space to sort of let things evolve. 
and you know the creativity needs to sort of have space 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 on multiple levels on this conceptual level and this physical level which your work envelops so well oh yeah <laughs> I mean, that's right it is about space I mean these schools, yeah, right. It's it's a whole thing. It's the it's the whole thing. It's the physical and the and the mental, yeah. So uh, I'd like to end our conversation on you know a a hopeful note um, because it's all it's all about hope. I mean this is it is very hopeful in general. You know there's there's um, even though you know things are in this this turmoil here, I think. Looking forward, I hope. I hope one thing that comes out of all this is a greater understanding of the needs that we have across the culture. You know, and school is one of them. Education and access to resources, equity, um, equality, justice in schools, and access to cultural resources in schools. I want to add something else. Access. I think that's um, you know for success in any of these fields, and we're talking about diversity. Um, giving people equal access and that's um, important to remember too. Of course, yes. We need this uh, democratization of the arts, making it more accessible as well. And and one th way to do that is to integrate it within the educational curriculum for all students because as we've discussed, it really benefits their whole learning experiences and you know, makes them become lifelong learners, makes them really thirsty to develop a, a sense of themselves and keep pushing the, the envelope, you know, as they go forward in life, that creativity, that thinking outside of the box that they get from having yeah. art in school. So uh, my, my last question is, what, what do you envision and hope for the future of education for, and for the future of maybe with, within the arts too? Um, I think access is the big, is the key word, and also, um, you know, a, a better understanding that students learn differently, that the uh, testing methods that are applied now is like a measure of um, intellect or success doesn't really reflect the um, potential and intelligence or, um, you know, brilliance in some cases of different students. So I think having a, a more um, broader understanding of, of, um, of what it means to be academically and successful in school and how to reach students who might think differently. I think that that's what I'd like to see. A broader understanding of how you know how information is imparted and how it's absorbed and how students learn. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak with me today about all these things. It's inspiring to see you know both schools as subject matter in artwork and the way that it starts conversations and you know hopefully we have. You know, more access to these spaces, we have more access to the arts in general, so we can keep having these dialogues with students and really have, you know, the community understand the power of art and the impact that art can have. Well, thank you so much for um, inviting me to uh, be part of this. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, listeners. This concludes the first ever Artfully Learning audio series episode. Stay tuned for more episodes to come. And if you haven't already, check out the Artfully Learning blog at theartsandeducation.wordpress.com. <laughs> <laughs>